Uh, all right, go ahead. Give me the thought. Okay. Now that I've adjusted my camera here so that we're, or so that I can see a little bit. There was maybe in the discourse, I would say, In the discourse, maybe several months ago, there was a move that was being done or a thing that was being said by people. What they would say is kind of in a snarking, maybe joking, sarcastic manner. They would say, they would use the phrase, my brother in Christ. Uh -huh. Do you remember this? No. They were saying it in a snarky manner though, huh? Well, I wouldn't say snarky. It was more like a meme format. They would say, I'm sorry. My brother in Christ, what are you doing? My brother in Christ, you are the person making the mistake. Mm. Okay? It was part of like this kind of done in jest sort of thing. Were, were, what was the context between in terms of the relationship between the people? Were they, was this kind uh, of an intramural Christian was, thing? Or was it, it was sort a of Twitter, a... It was a Twitter. I'm going to pull one up. Um <clears throat> Uh, so there's a guy who says, there's this trend among young guys where they idealize being an alienating weirdo. My brother in Christ, stop scaring the hose. Or uh, my um, many Dems walking around like they don't want to get denied opportunities. My brother in Christ, you're not going to get denied. I think he's Andrew. I think he's Henry. My brother in Christ, that is the godlike physical embodiment of consequence. My brother in Christ, a Twitter user just called you mid. You will live. So it's sort of a a snarky term to endear someone okay huh. this started happening maybe in 2020 and i just want to say it's always the jesters who the jester who's allowed to say things first uh, that's good christ is about christ is about to return to prominence in the discourse in a way that i don't think people were ready for i don't i don't think they get it i think I think the political things and the doctrinal things are important, but before we can even get around to the political and the doctrinal things, we have to have Christ come back into the discourse, and that's happening. Interesting. It's already occurred. Christ is already is already moving back into the discourse. You can see it everywhere. Yeah. It's happening all over the place. People are upset on the political right because they're saying, like, these people are blaspheming the name of Christ with their bad doctrine. I'm like, mm, they are but they're talking about him. <laughs> in That's a certain true. sense, artists, in a certain sense, artists and progressives are like, are, are kind of like women. The one thing you can't do is bore them. She can hate you, but at least she's thinking about you. She's <laughs> talking about you. You matter to her in some way. You can take a girl who's annoyed with her and say, actually, and she gets something, she goes, you know, I was annoyed with you, but you're actually not that bad. The girl that doesn't know you exist, you can't get to know. That's true. That's true. Right? That's and true. this, this, this is this is some of the dynamic that is happening at the moment. Is that Christ is returning to prominence in the discourse in a way which I think most people didn't understand. The the emptying out of meaning could not continue, and so it didn't. I think I think you're very on to something. I was watching the Jordan Peterson, Daniel Dennett conversation and just realizing, I, I realized that after I did a Randall's conversation with a guy who's an, uh, uh, an army chaplain, and he was saying, I just love how Jordan Peterson talks about the Bible and everything he does now. And I thought, my goodness, he does. And then, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're, you're talking to Bishop Barron, but it's a wholly other thing when you're talking to Daniel Dennett. And you just keep using now. He'll still have his Egyptian mythology um, examples, illustrations too. But that's a that's a really interesting observation, especially in the context of the Daniel Dennett talk, where Dennett was just, I he was just I, I don't know what's going on with the man, but I thought anybody who's paying attention to anything. Uh, to know what's happening in this conversation. And he was the last person to see, to know what was happening in that conversation. 
And it was, so it was, oh, that's, that's so interesting. Jordan also, when he was talking to Michael Schellenberger, which was also a very interesting conversation because Michael sort of said, well, both Jordan, both you and I are people of faith. And I thought, hmm, this is getting interesting. And then Jordan starts talking about the ARC conference. And he says, it's this big, it's this big battle at ARC, how explicitly Christian we should sort of be because Jonathan Peugeot in his talk at ARC had all the Christians raise their hand. And, um, and it was like most of the people in the room and where it's different in the UK. Now, Canada sort of in between the UK and the U S in that, but in the UK to have all of those people say, yeah, I, I go to church and I'm a Christian. Everyone in the UK is like, and so your point about even, even if Jesus comes into the conversation in a meme, he is going to start colonizing it all over again in the way that i use the word a lot of yeah. people don't like how i use the word colonize just because uh, they they get they get they get the shivers when i say that word um i mean what do you expect <laughs> the darkness doesn't drive out light now does it <laughs> no it does not <laughs> I mean, people the memes are striking a match and people are surprised that we're finding heat and light. I, yeah. I don't understand this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Christ is going to make his way back into the discourse. Jordan made a comment. So one of the things that happens in the, oh, ooh, there's, there's a lot to go into here. Um, there's this thing that people do where they kind of nitpick at the meaning of words in order to miss the point. And, and Jordan, Jordan Peterson kind of radiates meaning in such a way that if you stare at the, at a, at a single leaf long enough, you can really miss the forest. And one of the things he said is that the Bible is the original book of Western civilization. And like all of these like snippy little academics, said, well, that wasn't the first collected codex. You're missing the point. What 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 he's talking about is that if you you'll notice that there's citation chains in the academic literature where they cite back and 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 it's all built on something. What what Jordan is arguing is that the Bible is the collection of the original things that started getting cited in even in ways that were. Uh, or getting quoted and replicated and brought out. That's his point. Right, right. And he's been making that point for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, when he, when I first started listening to him in 2017, he was basically pushing the point that you don't have, we don't have Western civilization without the concept of God at the base of it. And he's been continuing to sort of clarify that point, And he's been working towards this book. You know, back to your mean point, it was very interesting when when Eric Weinstein was doing his portal thing and he had Ross Douthat on. Eric basically said, you know, I think, you know, if, if Jesus were alive today, would he sort of be dismissed by getting memed to death? But I, I think the thing about Jesus is that no matter, so so one of my uh, my future daughter-in-law um, is now spending more time at the house because my son moved moved back because he's got to save for the wedding, et cetera, et cetera. And so every you know she gets the remote sometimes, and she put on this this drippy show, The Vampire Diaries. Which <laughs> have you ever seen this program? I can only imagine. Oh my! Oh my! It is just. It is. It is just. Hysteria. I think it like went on for nine seasons. Anyway, and so we're always just laughing about all the different vampire universes. But in this particular vampire universe, the vampire can't come in the house unless you welcome them in, invite them in. But it yeah. doesn't matter if you don't know it's a vampire or if you don't know, like one vampire, one bad vampire got invited into the house by posing as a pizza guy. And, and in some ways, Jesus is kind of like that. It's just that 
it, it doesn't matter what you think of him. It doesn't matter if you're making fun of him. It doesn't matter quite what you're doing with him. Once you invite him into the conversation, even as a meme, it's he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna smuggle his stuff in. And increasingly, I've been thinking that this is actually really the history of the the world since the 20th century. And this is where Jesus has sort of smuggled himself into into the code in other religions and other cultures. And it doesn't mean that there isn't tons of stuff wrong. It's just that like you like the point that you're making, even if you're memeing him, you you're just it's sort of like, OK, I'm going to let I'm going to let the lion into my house and I'm going to make fun of him. Yeah, but he's still a lion. Yeah. <laughs> There's there's two points to be made here. First off, uh, Jordan always talks about how how the Bible is like the 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 thing against which everything else has meaning. Yeah. It's kind of the thing that's built, and <clears throat> the the kind of secular left tries to mock him for that with a sort of I talk all the time and I don't use biblical metaphors. And the you've missed the crux of the issue, Jordan. And I'm like, <laughs> has he? Uh, and then. And then there's the inerrantists who are like, it's literally propositionally true. It's like the Bible is a set of propositions, which are correct. And so there's this weird way. Uh, the inerrantists will very often say to many of the progressives who say the Bible's just a collection of myths and stories that guide us, that they have a low view of scripture because they don't believe it's literally true. And Jordan is saying to everyone that it's not only is the Bible true, but the Bible is the very ground at which truth can be understood in civilization. So in a weird way, Jordan Peterson is a man who has not yet declared faith in Christ and has a higher view of Scripture than most Christians. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a very elevated. Yeah, and, like and the inerrantists are, are saying, "Look, we believe the Bible is true," and Jordan's like, "Well, that's a low view." You know. It's like, <laughs> You're, you don't have nearly enough. You don't have nearly enough respect for the scriptures, guys. It's the very ground of the possibility of meaning in Western civilization, at least. <laughs> Not only that, but it contains all the archetypical stories which bake in all the foundations, which which bake in the meaning of all of the transcendentals, which unify at the very top. Like there are history books that are propositionally true all the way through. The Bible's more than that. Yeah. Um. And so yeah. now yeah. I've, and, and it also shows a, the re the recession of modernity because and and that's what's also so interesting about this moment is that all of the sort of modernist like, exactly as you just described well what the Bible is is this this bucket of propositions and I mean because this was the project of the last two hundred years in biblical studies okay the Bible is yeah. a bucket of propositions and what we'd like to do is separate all of the um, you know, it's the chaff that it's all the narrative and poetry around it. We're just going to get rid of that and we'll be left with the bucket. And once we have the bucket, then we'll, well, then you'll what? Well, what will you do when you're left with that bucket? And then, you yeah. know, then you give that bucket and say, Jordan, take this bucket. And he's like, I'm not quite sure what to do with that bucket. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Carl Rapp in Fleeing the Universal says that this goes back to when the poets uh, were fighting with the philosophers about who was preeminent, right? That that the philosophers were trying to do, were say, look, we're the ones who are using rationality, reason, Ar Aristotelianism, right? And the poets were saying, no, we're we're pulling down the ineffable. And there's this been kind of fight going on. Yeah. I have to say, um, I defend a vision of Enlightenment liberalism that puts Enlightenment liberalism back in its place, because the Enlightened Liberal Project tried to use its own sparse propositional content as the ground for everything, and that doesn't work. Yeah. It 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 was a hammer that was meant to pit nails, and then they said, "Well, we can use this as a screwdriver and a can opener and a television remote. I'm going to ride it to work." <laughs> it's like, no, I no, you can't you can't do that. That's not gonna that's not gonna go. But um, I think. So they, Verveke and Peterson were also talking about perception. And I'm going to push back on, in this conversation, I'm going to push back on both of them and the postmodernists. Okay. And so first off, I have to say something about what the postmodernists did, which and a lot of people have had a hard time. So I thought of a new analogy. 
which I got from somebody who got it from somebody else, and its origins are lost to the mists of time for all I know. But if I ever find it up, it's not mine. This is like the line, people are like tea bags. If you want to find out what's in them, put them in hot water. I don't know where that line came from. I have no idea. It's lost to the mist of history. So I can't cite that person. Now, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, says to the pagans, you have built your God out of stone and wood. You made it yourselves, and then you bow down and worship him. The underlying impulse of the postmodernists is to say your gods of reason, truth, and objectivity are constructed out of words and you bow down and worship them. That's essentially what's going on. Yeah. yeah. It's all just yeah. words and language. It's all socially constructed, everything. Yeah. yeah. That's what the postmodernists did. There are two movements that were kind of doing the same thing from opposite ends. There's the postmodernists and the logical positivists. Yeah, yeah. And the the logical positivists. So the postmodernists, we talk about them all the time. Dare to go, yada yada. I won't rehash that here. If you want to go, there's plenty of content. Lots of people have explained it. Read fleeing the universal or cynical theories or mind language in society or Yasha Monk's book or my forthcoming book or there's lots of there's lots of information on the postmodernists. The logical positivists and the positivists in general had the idea that essentially they boiled everything down to facts and logic. Right. You you had analytic truths which are like the mathematical truth and then you had the truth you could check about the world through empirical experience. And the only thing you have access to is your sense datum, which is the sensations that are created by, by your interaction with the world. That's it. You don't have unmediated access to the world. And in both of these things, they've the error has been to the the error which is endemic to Western philosophy in general is the conflation of epistemology with ontology. liberalism kicks the ontological can down the road because what liberalism says is we're not going to solve the greater questions. We're going to deal on an epistemic level of what we believe the truth to be rather than what the ultimate ground of it is. Right. In that play, we're splicing the ontological question off. Right. But that's not how people live when they step out of the political realm. Right. And if you try to imply you kick the ontological can down the road eternally, there's a problem. Right. When we try to bring the ontology back in, we conflate them. So the way that this works out in postmodernism is that they conflate the subjective ontology of a proposition with being epistemically uh, subjective. Yeah. In other words, this, because the, the, propos the existence of the proposition, the proposition was created in a social procedure using language, uh, the grubby little fingerprints of all of the bigotries and the sexism da, 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 are part of the process of the formation of the ontology of it. That is, the proposition exists in our head. We created the proposition that this is a blue bandana. And therefore, because it is ontologically subjective, that somehow the content must also be epistemologically subjective, and that's a mistake. The epistemic ontology and the the sorry the epistemic objectivity and the ontological objectivity are two separate things. And when you conflate them, but this is the same mistake that the logical positivists made because they said that the meaning of a uh, of a um, that the verification of a proposition is its meaning, or is in part its meaning, or maybe to say that in a different way that won't get me nitpicked to death by analytic philosophers that a proposition has meaning if and only if it's verif verifiable in principle. Well, the meaning of the proposition is its ontology. It can have a meaning and mean something and be a proposition, have an ontology only if it can be verified. That's epistemology. And as my friend John Searle, who I continue to quote and will quote at great length, despite uh, despite pleas to the contrary, uh, point out that this is wrong. All of this is a mistake. And they're all doing, making the same mistake, completing epistemology and ontology, right? That's endemic to Western civilization. And we keep doing this. 
And so part of the question when we talk about things being subjective and objective and subjective and objective is that we don't splice apart, split apart, break apart, draw lines between the ontology and the epistemology. And so what we end up with is a situation in which we confuse ontological subjectivity, that is mind-dependent ideas and propositions, with epistemic subjectivity with respect to how things really are in the world. And that leads us down a dangerous path in both cases. And so the the problem is um, that with the positivists, you end up with that sort of old line moral relativism you get scientific truth they hold on to but they end up with moral relativism and the postmodernists have relativism with respect to both and people say well who caused the nihilism of western civilization and half the people are pointing at the logical positivist and half the people are pointing at the postmodernist and my answer is it doesn't matter how you get the carbs and sugar your insulin is still going to spike and both of these things metabolize into the world as moral relativism and that's part of the problem that we're in, is that many of the people who are pushing hardest against the postmodernist doctrines for eroding science yeah. don't realize that they have likewise created a very similar problem with their uh, uh, secularism, which metabolizes into the culture as sort of Reddit facts and logic style thinking. Right. Right. Fedora hat tipping atheists of the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's and, a huge and problem. they're sort of and and half of them are cozying up to Christians because they need them <laughs> because the Christians um because they lost they they're losing their institutions and Christians still have some institutions and so and many of the Christians that are cozying up to them are basically their um epistemic cousins because they're the ones that the Bible is the bucket of propositions. And yeah. so you watch and those this... you watch those alliances form, and the alliances are very strange. It's it's fascinating watching them form, and but but a lot of this has to do with again the challenge of it, it was fascinating listening to again I don't know if you've heard it yet the Daniel the stuff Daniel <laughs> Dennett would say with Jordan Peterson I just it was absolutely fascinating because he was just basically he was just sort of conceding everything <laughs> as he was going. He says, yeah, well, you know. The science, which of course gives us certainty and everything, this only works when like we're all we're all sitting there in agreement and someone comes in and we say, No, you can't say that. And but it's like, oh, but what what is the container? And civilization, that has nothing to do with religion. Oh. I you maybe you should check your notes with Richard Dawkins here. Um so, but then but then of course, I mean, the I think the deeper angstier levels now are the fact that liberalism, as you said, sort of is a kicking of the can down the road. It worked in it worked in the West because all of the underneath stuff were basically, and this now is increasingly being seen by panicky atheists, all of this stuff down the road was all sort of all of these assumptions by Christians were held. And so you could just you could just work with a few things on top, but everyone, whether well, ostensibly what they declared or didn't declare confessionally, didn't matter because all of their assumptions were baked in. And now at this higher level of pluralism, um, everything's like, oh, well, wait a minute, what where where what do we agree on? And then suddenly you're back asking much more ontological questions, and and. There's and then, yeah. so which means that old issues now reemerge. Part of the so this is related to what Cyril calls the background and the network. Um, when Jordan talks about the counter enlightenment, it's, I had several conversations with his wife explaining postmodernism, and at some point, I'm going to push back on what him and Verveke, some of what him and Verveke say. I think they get a lot right. <clears throat> but they also get a lot wrong. Well, no, I shouldn't say they get a lot wrong. They get a lot which could be taken to be wrong if we don't really nail down exactly what's being said. Okay. Um, because we're dealing with such fine-grained issues, um, there's a problem of communication that exists. I haven't read Jordan's new book. I'm assuming he's a very clear writer and he'll get it down. Um, but there's a couple of things I want to well, talk about. Book isn't out until November, but he 
I don't think there'll be any surprises in the book, given the fact that he's basically writing the book as he's talking and we're listening to him talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we hop onto the matter of perception, which is where we're going to come down to, because we're going to have to drill through some things, I want to read you some something very profound from where th profound tip things typically come from, the American Congressional Record of the House of Representatives. So the this House. is, yeah, the House. This is from November 1st, 1967. And this is written by Honorable George P. Miller of California. And he's going to quote something that was written by Alter Bard McLeish in a recent issue of the Saturday Review. Here's what he's going to say. We're going to start with the quote from McLeish, and then we're going to get the Paul. He's just going to do his comments. There is, in truth, a terror in the world, and the arts have heard it as they always do. Under the hum of the miraculous machines and the ceaseless publications of the brilliant physicist, the silence waits, listens, and is heard. It is the silence of apprehension. We do not trust our time, and the reason we do not trust our time is because we, it is we who have made the time, and we do not trust ourselves. We have played the hero's part, mastered the monsters, accomplished the labors, become gods, and we do not trust ourselves as God. We know what we are. Why read this to this gathering? The people in this audience are men of action, and much of this uncertainty is unfamiliar to you. Yet NASA finds itself in the very center of this paradox, and it will become clear as I go on that we are here today have something to do about the problems McLeish states so eloquently. That we who are here today have something to do about the problems McLeish states so eloquently. There is no solution, single solution to this vast problem, no single element to fill out the void or simple way to restore faith in ourselves. Our homes and our churches must provide meaningful goals and standards, the absence of which makes for some of this dissatisfaction. But I read into this two things that relate to us. One, a desire for, one, a need, overriding compelling purposes related to fine and high ideals, and two, a way, a place in which we can work creatively and effectively in the attainment of those objectives. True. Part of our problem is the absence of goals and values that command assent, but more of it is a frustration. How can we be effective? What can we do? Where can we grow to make our contribution and realize our potential? That's 1967. The cracks are already there. Yeah. Like, this is decades ago. I mean, now also, I want to say, remember when we, when we had eloquent politicians who could say things intelligently and make good points? Remember that? We used to have those. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We we used to have men who would read the Saturday Review of Literature and 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 quote Archibald McLeish when they were discussing things with NASA. Yeah. We still we have those have men. We just don't send them to the House. No, <laughs> or the Congress. <laughs> or maybe they're smart enough not to go. <laughs> they're on YouTube. And TikTok, yeah. oh. he's right TikTok. there. He sees it. He sees. He sees the problem. Yeah. It's already beginning to show up. And so, <clears throat> what he's seeing is so. Searle talks about the nat background, the network, and the network of intentionality is all the ideas, all of your intentional conscious content. Right, everything that's about something dreams, visions, ideas, thoughts, goals, all the artifacts of consciousness, the things that furnish your conscious world and your ideas. That's right. intentionality just means ofness or aboutness. So anytime you have a thought of something or about something, that's that's intentionality. Yep. And he's saying you have an, a network of intentionality, all of these intentional bits of intentionality of knowing things and feeling things and having thoughts about things and imagination and all of that forms a network of intentionality. And that gets meaning up against a background. And the background is a set of capacities, things like knowing a language, having a prefrontal cortex, being able to see, having senses, the capacity to use language, the ability to think. And the background, and he says this in uh, his book on perception, he says, there's no hard and fast line between the uh, uh, the background and the network. Just like there's there's no hard and fast line between a tree and its roots. Um, they kind of bleed into each other. Right. And what's happened is that the larger background, uh, when you have a shared background, your network of intentionality 
uh, you can use the network of intentionality uh, to get clarity, to have meaning and to communicate. Yep. But when the background isn't shared, uh, because meaning occurs in a network against the background, when the background isn't shared, then it's hard to create shared meaning. Yes. Communication I think becomes difficult. I think that's exactly right. I think that's a great way to frame it. And postmodernism in es is, in essence, the destruction of the background. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense. what Searles, Searles says when he talks about reading, now here's here's the value of artists. He says that he read um, the Gulag Archipelago. Yeah. And he said, I didn't learn a single new proposition. I knew that everything had happened. And yet I had clarity, greater clarity about what hmm. went on in the Soviet Union. And he said, well, why did that happen? He said, it didn't increase my network. It flushed out the background. Ah, it's the background that changed. I like this language. Uh, this is really helpful. And it, it, you know, and it's and and when. So before that, Jordan, of course, had this. Tammy, Tammy joined the Catholic Church, and this, this one guy, uh, yes. called Calm Flynn, who's just on the hunt, and he wants to he wants to bag Jordan Peterson for Rome so bad. And, you know, so of course, it's just so much fun to watch. It's just so much fun to watch. And so Jordan's being a good egg. You know, he's being a good sport. His wife's going to church and it's like, well, this is putting Jordan in some uncomfortable places. So the guy just keeps leaning in on him. And, and then Jordan, of course, says, well, I'm just, I just exist on the border of things. That's so do I. That's why he'll become a Pentecostal. That's a <laughs> One of us, one of us. Um, but but I think you're. I think I think that's a nice. I think that's a nice way to frame it, because you know partly what Jordan is doing now in terms of the exorcism that he is, uh, the cultural exorcism that he is performing, is he is demonstrating that the background. <laughs> you, you don't live without a background, and it's just like you say once. Once you lose, once you lose the the sense of the background and the intentionality, it's funny because I never heard about this until I heard it on on Daniel Dennett's lips in that conversation. So he said it was like, what what what's what's this about? And he explained it a little bit. It was like, oh yeah, and you explained it just better yourself right now. But and and so again, Jordan's just basically he's just helping people see the background. And once you see the background, well now suddenly. And and this is so completely connected to the problems we bumped into with respect to seeing an AI. A camera sees nothing, and this goes back to Peterson and and Sam Harris. Peterson spends that whole first night with Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein, slowly trying to help Sam Harris see. And Sam Harris is like, "I'm not in the business of seeing. I want to. I want to. I want to have an argument about masturbation and God." Okay, Sam. Um, so no, that's really good. That's really helpful. Yeah. The the I I mean when you said exercise this the spirit, yeah. like Pentecostals, I mean Pentecostals didn't really have an apologetic. Our way of trying to get rid of secular humanism was to go walk up to basically try the cultural group and saying, out. And like that's not gonna work, right? The Catholics have have their own ritualistic way of doing things. That's not that's not either. Jordan's but it helps, exorcism, but it is, helps people. That I mean, a big part Jordan's of exorcism is 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 an exorcism through through a dialogue that fills the room up with the meaning that leaves that flushes out the background enough so right. that the plausibility of secular humanism simply dissolves. Right. Right. That's exactly that's that's the exorcism he is performing. And but you know who did it first? Thomas Nagel in Mind and Cosmos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's there too. <laughs> it's there too. And and by the way, people don't realize the degree to which the secular humanist vision caught on for aesthetic reasons because of its simplicity. To quote Quine, the people with an overly furnished universe have created an ugly how did he put it i have to find the quine quote he says it so beautifully um quine willard van orman quine who oh where's my quine my quine quotes it's just too beautiful it's so beautiful that i can't even think about it um oh let's find here 
he says that the over <laughs> that an overpopulated universe is in many ways unlovely. It offends the aesthetic sense of us who have a taste for desert landscapes. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. It was Quine, by the way, who wrote the two dogmas of empiricism, which knocked out in 1948 uh, um, logical positivism. What, and what, what, how do you spell his name? Quine, Q-U-I-N-E. Huh. Willard Van Orman Quine was a was a great writer. Um, um, <laughs> he's he's got some really really great lines um <laughs> confusion of sign and object is original sin coeval with the word uh wow yeah wow it... <laughs> that's that is really good that is really good he so let's uh, describe aristotle's view of language as uh aristotle he says aristotle's view of language is a uh, that meaning is what happens when the essence is divorced from the object of reference and married to the word. Hmm. Just like, he's so good. But wow. Quine gets a lot out of these beautiful turns of phrases. Huh. But Quine had the idea also of a web of meaning. Where you had certain things that were closer to the center and certain things that were closer to the fringe. If that sounds familiar, let me, you know, stop me. Hmm. And, and, Quine, Quine saw that these things were kind of interconnected. And if you look at him and you look at Dare to Schema, boy, there's, if you squint at them enough, you know, hmm. a lot of, a lot of that positivist philosophy is relativism in sheep's clothing. Uh, to steal another phrase from Quine. Um, <laughs> Who, who referred to a certain view as set theory in sheep's clothing, which I thought was really funny. Uh, <laughs> I love People don't realize how often I'm stealing from Quine and Davidson and Carnap and all of those guys. Cause nobody reads those, those yeah. early analytic philosophers anymore. Like, like people say, think if they say, let P be such that and necessary and sufficient conditions and relevantly sufficiently similar that they're doing analytic philosophy and they're not. That's not how those guys were operating. Hmm. But the but the point here is is that this this background the network thing kind of gets uh um that there was an aesthetic appeal to to op adopting a background of the secular humanist thought which is if we can simplify it down, we can get everything we want. We can get these simple things and then we can build on it and right. things get a little bit right. more com complex. And they wanted to make things simple. They wanted a simple world and a simple universe. And they didn't realize that all of the tools of science that they were using come out of that the meaning of those things occurs against a very particular kind of a background. The reason that science has emerged in Western civilization before it emerged other places is not because of the network of propositions that they had. It's because of the background. the background. And again, where I was going with this is the the crisis in the church right now is, why would I go there? And I think the answer is because you have to get the background. And if you don't get the background and because I think you're right, because, and then part of what happened in a lot of churches was, well, we're going to give you the bucket of propositions and yeah. we're going to, we're going to run you through the bucket of propositions. And when you recognize that you can regurgitate to us, the bucket of propositions, then, then you will have what you need to go out into the world. But it's exactly the same vision that you just stated with the, um, with the positivists. It's exactly the same vision. Mm -hmm. it's very similar and yeah. the irony of it is quine captures this contradiction without meaning to hmm. if i wanted to be postmodern i could read quine against himself because he wants to reduce things to science and say that science is all there is and so he wants yeah. to say well he wants this unlovely universe and how does he describe this he says language is conceived in sin and science is science is its redemption wow 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 that and that metaphor works because it's happening against the very background Quine wants to reject. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah.
That's it's super, perfect. That's super compressed. That is just like, wow. Oh, that's fascinating. I'm dropping that into the discourse now. We're going to see what happens over the next few months. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And and these, yeah, that's that's what he says. He says <laughs> all of these things. It's so in, it's so interesting too how so so my I mean I'm I'm much more a I, I much more work in the practical area of this. I mean I tend to work directly with people and as I watch I watch who I watch who moves, who 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 changes chairs in this theater, who used to sit over there with a positive positive ifs and now they've moved over and are sitting with a different group and it's and of course, Jordan has been the, he's provoked a lot of that um, while still, it, it's just, you know, it's just so amazing how, how, how compartmentalized people are that the, I mean, my favorite, my favorite term for Jordan Peterson has long been the unauthorized exorcist of Mark 9. Because in Mark 9, the disciples are all hanging out and loving being with Jesus, even though he's strange and scares them sometimes. And and there's somebody out there who's casting out demons in Jesus' name, and the disciples are suddenly concerned about their intellectual property rights, and they want to go and shut them down. And Jesus says, leave them alone. Well, and, well. And so that's, and in many ways, that's sort of been Jordan. And... But but he's so compartmentalized that, and, and to me this is to me this is just illustrative of the fact that God works through who He wants the way He wants, <laughs> and so often we are completely clueless clueless about exactly what God is doing through us. Yeah. Richard Dawkins doesn't realize that the velvet glove of science is filled with the hand of God, and and because of that. Um, he, he, he's been holding the hand of God the whole time and hasn't realized it. He, mm. When when mm. Jordan was the first, when Jordan pulled out that paper, he said that you could uh, things are a microcosm of the environment that they grew up in, and it's like, yeah, science is a microcosm of the backgrounds against which it it has meaning. Yeah, yeah. Um, the problem with the postmodernists is they looked at the background and said, well, the background is all constructed too. It's all socially constructed. Everything is socially right. constructed. Once right. you get through the language, there's nothing. Right. You see through everything and there's nothing left. Right. The, but they all but they also the, they also live lives and completely forget. I mean, that's the point that C.S. Lewis made about how many of his philosophical adversaries that they they talk this way over here and then they go over here and live lives completely forgetting what because is it, you, you, you cannot apply Chester that thing. Yeah. G.K. Chesterton, what did G.K. Chesterton said that the scientist sits in his uh, sits in his laboratory and says that man is nothing but an animal. And then he takes his an animal, and then he takes his hat and his umbrella and walks down to the political meeting and complains that men are treated like animals. <laughs> oh, so far, so far today we have Davidson, Searle, Quine, and Chesterton coming from a Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I all of up. all of the roots are intertwined. Yes, and you can pull things out. See, part of the, what the see the postmodernists like to do close reading, but they never were reading very closely. And the part of the problem is that they they didn't learn to read the lines before they read between the lines, and they end up with doing this sort of a word association thing. Hmm. <clears throat> it is true that you can glean things from a re from a writer that the writer never intended you to read but that didn't mean that the writer that the words didn't have meaning or that didn't center around the author's intent it just means that there are certain things which you can be you could have that are not logically implied but what Grice, what Grice might call conversational implicature now we've quoted Paul Grice as well good um and that are are suggested by the text, but 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 not in the way that the postmodernists were doing because they were saying, well, it suggests about power, and they're putting that lens on, and then it's like that's not actually what's happening. 
An example is Klein, Klein's being an atheist and saying that we don't need God. And the way that we know that we don't need God is because language is conceived in sin and science is its redemption. That's why we don't need the biblical stories. It's like a Klein, excuse me, Klein, what metaphor are you using? And why did you make the point that way? Because yeah. you're using things that people understand. I mean, he also... Students of the heavens are separatable into astronomers and astrologers as readily as are the minor domestic ruminants into sheep and goats, but the separation of philosophers into sages and cranks seems to be more sensitive to frames of reference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does, because of the background, Klein. Klein doesn't see that until Searle gets to it, right? Searle sees the whole thing too. And this one, remember with our conversation with Pajot? And I point, I brought up that Searle thing and Searle says, we just don't need God anymore. And I said, he solves the problem in the wrong direction. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Searle is also solving the problem in the wrong direction. That God has changed meanings for us. Yeah, the problem is to go back. But we're, we're caught in a state where we where like, like this is why nostalgia is all the rage, right? People say we want to go like we love the 80s. We love it. But we you ask them why it was made it great when they didn't have any of the technology. And they go, I don't know. We're in this weird cultural moment where we want to go back to the past, but we've forgotten what we left there. So we're stuck between nostalgia and amnesia. Yeah. And and we're caught in both. We've forgotten. And and um, the, the Christian world just utterly failed to understand what was going on. Yeah. I mean, Bill Craig did Yeoman's work during the rise of the four atheists, but it seems to me now that most of the Christians in the humanities govern what they say or who they speak to by whether or not those people will say things that will be embarrassing to them in front of Chrissy Stroop. Who's Chrissy Stroop? Or or uh, Chrissy Stroop is a trans woman who... Oh, okay. <laughs> Chris- I had no idea who Chrissy Stroop was. <laughs> who used to be Christopher Stroop, who ran oh. an organization called Empty the Pews. Oh, you're wow. embarrassing me in front of the secular humanists. Yeah. Yeah. You're embarrassing me in front of Stanley Fish. You're yeah. embarrassing yeah. me in front of Paul DeMand. You're humiliating me in front of the, yeah. the people from, uh, I'm humiliated in front of Judith Butler for you for bringing these things up. Well, that's... And, and so it's, it's, it's this weird thing and, and people don't want to dig down to the problem. And another part of it is, is like a lot of the, the analytic philosophy that led us to here, nobody reads that. Yeah. How many people, how many Christian analytic philosophers have read anything by Quine other than the two dogmas of empiricism? Probably nothing. How many of them have read Semantics, Empiricism, and Ontology by Rudolf Carnap? The last gasp of logical positivism? Probably none of them. Um, Word and Object by Quine? Probably none of them. Um, the Logical Shape of the World by Rudolf Carnap? Probably none of them. Um, uh, Essays on Truth and Interpretation by Donald Davidson? Probably none of them. Nobody reads this stuff. And so nobody understands what the logical positivist project was and what they got right and what they got wrong. Mm. Um, people may have read How to Do Things with Words by Austin, but they haven't read Sense and Sensibilia. They don't know what the Ben Stick argument is. A lot of them haven't even read the, the Christian stuff. When I say the extra lion problem, there's a handful of people who know what that is or the wayward Adam problem. And nobody knows which how that interacts with Jaguan Kim's philosophy of mind. They don't know. We haven't yeah. read this. This is all gone. It's just we're looking at the snapshots of philosophy as they are. And we're maybe holding on to a few out arguments from Plantinga and Swinburne. Meanwhile, that background that that existed, like the history of philosophy Somebody asks, why do we continue to teach the history of philosophy? We don't need to know like the history of every theory of physics. Why? Because it's that history of philosophy which maintains your background against which everything has meaning. And when you forget the background, your network starts to lose its cohesiveness because the network is only interpreted against the background. Which is, interestingly enough, sort of also Verveke's relevance realization point that, in fact... They're, they're always, because the relevance realization is essentially a network and background issue. You have to know, yeah. be able to distinguish them. You have to be able to differentiate them. And for all, for all that John has talked about, maybe he'll, if he watches this, he'll come back. I, I don't know that he's actually, I don't, I, I think he's identified a number of I think he's been able to go down a level of resolution to say, now these are some of the things at play that sort of help us to distinguish them. But I think 
I, I don't, I think we're, I think we're just too deep that will, I think we're deeper than, I think we are, we ourselves are deeper than the network or the consciousness. I loved it when McGillchrist said our conscious, basically our conscious, our unconscious selves are like 90, what did you say? 97 and a half percent of us. And our consciousness is just like this tiny little thing. And that seemed right. And what that means is that the network will always be grossly limited against the background. Yeah. And it's also why, as Quine said, um, because we're going to quote Quine some more, um, decisions in science as in life can be difficult and there's no simple touchstone for responsible belief. There is no procedure of mechanical verification in which we can guarantee a proper and appropriate epistemology, yeah. right? Yeah. <clears throat> for, yeah. You can do it in yeah. science, in a very limited yeah. realm of science, but in ethics and in yeah. metaphysics. Yeah. The only, well, I mean, P.G. Campbell said that the only test of a true metaphysics is that it's it's a thing you can't describe your way out of. <laughs> but, That's a but, good quote. Too. I know. That was my teacher. Uh -huh. My, my teacher was Peter Campbell, who was taught by S.C. Koval, who was taught by Gilbert Ryle. I don't have a degree, but I'm not untrained. No. <laughs> now, I, I want to, I want to, I mean, you and I can. But there's a there's another thing we have to talk about perception here for a moment. Okay. And Jordan Peterson said, you see the value of the thing before you see the thing. Right. I don't know what he means by that, but I'm not sure he's right. Oh. Picture a hammer. Well, what's the value of a hammer? Yeah, I don't know that we see the value. I think we certainly see a value because that, I mean, that's the whole, I mean, his argument, again, is basically the network. And well, wait, wait, no, but, 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 but follow it. Okay. Follow it. What's a hammer used for? Uh, whatever we think we need to use it for at the moment. What, 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 and what allows us to use it for that purpose? What about the hammer lets us use it for that purpose? Basically, experience with with things that are like it, having achieved no, no. something to the end that we have had. Experience. That hammer can be used in this way. What allows that hammer to be used in this way? Our it's agency. physical properties. It's physical properties. Yes. Because if it didn't have those physical properties, it couldn't use that. Yes. So you couldn't see the possibilities for how the hammer could be used unless you oh. could see its physical properties. So the properties come first. But don't worry, John Searle already solved this problem in seeing things as they are. And there's a difference between seeing that and seeing as. I mm. see the lower level properties of the things first. I see that. And then I see it as something. Mm. Right? It's the seeing that, which is my perceptual faculties pick up the seeing that. And then my natural, my intentionality, my network and background allow me to see it as and the seeing hmm. as presents itself first because that's more relevant than the seeing that. I see my car as a car, right? I just see it as a vehicle. I don't have to deduce from its properties that it's a vehicle because that's already done by the network and background. Right. And this is this is sort of where <clears throat> Peterson and McGilchrist kind of ran into each other because Peterson was pushing his thing and Gilchrist basically backed up. And I think he made a similar move to what you just made. Yep. And so the other thing that is going on here is that in addition to that, uh, so there's the two dogmas of empiricism, right? That's a very famous paper in philosophy. Uh, it was by Quine. Uh, let me see if I can just pull it up here just so I can get uh, when it was written. I believe it was published in 1951 first. Um, and uh, hold on a second. I just want to read them. Okay, so I just want to. I just want to make sure I have that right. Um, so it was published, I believe, in 1951, but there was an earlier version that was written, and I. Th I think there was an interview where Donald Davidson, who was a student of Quine, said he got to read it first. That pub that that 
that was that argument that paper's been cited 11,000 times wow it's one of the most celebrated papers in analytic philosophy and it knocked out logical positivism hmm. um it was so devastating that carnap didn't respond to it until i believe 1988 like he he nailed carnap Wow. He pinned Carnap to the wall with that one. Now, so it killed off logical positivism. But as with analytic philosophy, very often what happens is it's it's an argument that has flaws in it all over the place. But he sketches out a large, his larger point kind of stands up. Hmm. Um, so the paper, so the first, the, the paper has two dogmas in it. One is analytic, one is the analytic synthetic divide. And the second is a form of reductionism. And the reductionism is something like um, uh, a meaningful statement is the same as some sort of logical. I'll just read the quote. Uh, meaningful statements is equivalent to some logical construct upon which terms refer to immediate experience. Right. So that's reductionism. Everything is reduced to statements about immediate experience and then the analytic synthetic divide. And he knocks those out or so he thinks. You can't. He, he's, he uses an example of a. Everything extended is green. Extended just means takes up space. Or everything green is extended. He says, is that analytic or synthetic? <clears throat> is it analytic and true in terms of its meaning like two plus two equals four? Or is it something that we have to go out and verify? Hmm. He says, I don't know. And he's like, so his whole point is that the, the notion of analyticity is either circular or unclear. Hmm. By the way, blurring lines between concepts, where have we seen this before? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Thurl in 1967 pushes back on him and says, I don't think that the synthetic analytic divide is all that big a deal or all that useful, but Klein's argument is bad because finding a concept which is on the line doesn't prove there are no line. It tends to prove the opposite because in order to find a statement that's on the line, you have to know where the lines are. Yeah. Which is a, an argument that Thurl is going to use repeatedly. His example of a statement, uh, or of a definition of a term, which uh, is clear enough, although it may admit of exceptions, is a woman, which he defines as adult human female. <laughs> and his response, when someone says, how do you know that an adult human female is a woman? He talks about linguistic intuition. He just said, if someone would push hard enough, the only adequate response is, I speak English, because we're dealing with different... <laughs> <laughs> different intuitions, different intuitions, different understanding of meaning and different backgrounds. And it was Searle who coined the terms network and background in his book in 1986 called Intentionality. And it's also what he leverages in uh, part of what he uses to come up with this theory of perception. And his point is direct realism is correct. There is no interpretive framework between us and the world. That's wrong. The postmodernists got that wrong. We don't see the world through a structure of value. Hmm. We see it with a structure of value. It's not a veil. It's a set of tools that we use. And the other thing is this. Far from seeing the world, seeing the world with a structure of value doesn't undermine its objectivity. It tends to point the opposite. Right. Because if you want to use a structure of value to view the world then you have to be able to do things with your epistemic apparatus. And if the things have the value they think they do, like hammers, and you can really use them in the way that you are, that means that the structure of value is actually tracking with the way things in the world really are. Right, right. Which means the structure of value, if your value, as long as your structure of value is true as the arrow flies, yep. then the structure of value is actually riding along with the seeing of the things, the lower level properties. And those tend to provide a kind of dual check on each other, right? I can see that these things, I can perceive that this has this properties, which means this isn't fit for what I want to use it for. I value it for something it doesn't have. If I see the value of a thing and I try to use it for that and it doesn't work, then it tells me that my understanding of how value aligns with the world is somewhat amiss. It doesn't undermine the objectivity that the postmodernist thought it does. It reinforces it. Hmm. Hmm. 
makes sense. Searle doesn't say that I'm saying that. That's my yeah. argument. Yeah, it's a good I'm argument for that. It's a good argument. I'm taking, I'm taking credit. There uh, you go. <laughs> now you mentioned. But, have but you have is... you been writing? Have you been working on? Have you been publishing? I have been writing. I have not been publishing. I'm oh. still writing okay. and explaining, and I'm 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 working through this whole thing. This this po point about perception when when the this veil of interpretation. This wanting to view the world hermeneutically and say that the interpretation uh, and that the truth and the objectivity are socially constructed is is has had disastrous consequences. But but trying to understand all truth as a series of propositions, rather than understanding that we don't actually, that language is a thing that we use to communicate what we know but it doesn't fully grasp the fullness of what we know because all of our knowledge is in the background. Right. For example, um, there does not exist in New York City right now a 73,000-foot statue of Godzilla. You've never thought of that proposition before that, but you knew it Yep. because it's in your background. Yep, yep, yep. There's a lot of knowledge that's stored in our background and our network that we haven't encoded into language. Yeah. So the yeah. language doesn't act. I mean, Donald Davidson already knocked out the idea of conceptual schemes as filters in a paper in like 1975, which nobody is, which everyone's forgotten about. Uh, he says that conceptual relativism is a heady doctrine if one could make sense of it. <laughs> 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 Again, another brilliant writer, which nobody reads. Um, and I actually have the book right. I'll pull it out because it's just too darn good. You have to. You have to. Um, um, Did you ever think about the fact that all of this stuff is is riding on us? Because uh, you know, see us. Go ahead. Um, I'll just read the point here. He said, "Yeah, um, on the very oh, uh, where does he say it? Along essay on the very idea of a conceptual scheme scouts the intelligibility of claims that different languages or conceptual schemes divide up or cope with reality in importantly different ways." Our general method of interpretation forestalls the possibility of discovering that others have radically different intellectual equipment. But more important, it is argued that if we reject the idea of an uninterpreted source of evidence, no loom is left for a dualism of skin and content. Without such a dualism, we cannot make sense of conceptual relativism. This does not mean that we must give up the idea of an objective world independent of our knowledge of it. The argument against conceptual relativism shows rather that the language is not a screen or filter through which our knowledge of the world must pass. Hmm. Hold up the book. Right. You have to hold, okay. hold hold up the book, the cover of the book. So we, no, no, that side of the book. Okay. <laughs> Inquiries into inter inter truth and interpretation. This is this has been so helpful. Um, this has been very helpful in terms of just sort of recalibrating and helping to regulate a lot of the common mysteries that we see around us. But, you know, the thought I had was, and, and I have this a lot because again, I, I talked to Randall's on the internet and I, I looked up our first, the, our first big conversation was January of 2022 you and um, me or you and Verveke? You and me. Okay. I talked to Verveke before that. But um, but it's just interesting how because I'm really, I'm really enjoying what you're doing here. You're most known, at least at this point, on Twitter. I don't know if yeah. you um, which is a is an interesting, it's an interesting medium for you, given who you are. Um, you don't you you're you're writing, you haven't published a book. But again, your background point is, I mean, you've you've mentioned a whole bunch of interesting philosophers that I have never heard of because I, I am by no means a philosopher. 
Um, I, I hadn't studied philosophy. You know, I, I took some philosophy classes in college, but so on and so forth. And so it's just, it's just interesting when I think about what is riding through you. And right now it's riding through you into the world through this channel. It's a, it's a, and because I mean, you're, you're an interesting guy. And if anybody's curious about that, you can go find, if you just search Vanderclay vocal distance on YouTube, it's the first video that comes up. What we did together, or at least is on my channel, because the algorithms are always context dependent. I'd have to check that in a different, uh, in something that where I'm not logged in anyway. Um, but it's, it's just interesting how, it's just interesting how this stuff is riding through us as we're as we're talking here as we're as we're mapping the world as we're sharing because yeah. it's just it's just interesting how this stuff is riding through us we're, 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 mm. i almost get the sense that we're sort of like you know the little paper cups you get if you go to costco and they have all these samples and you get just this. I, I don't know if you got Costco in in Canada or not, but um, but but the, you know you get this little sample and you you, know, you maybe you'll take this little bite of whatever it is they're sampling and you throw it away. I mean, we're 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 almost the disposable cups here. <laughs> you you were going to ask another question about riding on us, or is it weird that we're. What were you going to ask? The stuff, it's, is it weird that the stuff is riding through us? Because you must you must have a sense of this. Because again, I mean, last time we talked, we we had a good long conversation. And then actually most of our conversation was unrecorded, which was great. Um, because we got a chance to get to know each other a little bit better. But yeah, we did. But here is this, you know, here is this, because you are in many ways a rando out there. I mean, you, you've, <laughs> you've yes. accumulated for yourself a, 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 a significant... Twitter account, but you know, it, it could, it could all go away. Um, so, so in a sense, there's a piece of you that's riding on Twitter. There's a piece of me that's riding on YouTube. Um, yeah. and yeah. we're, we're, we're connecting through these things. And I, I just love the point that you made right now about, I, I often look at like babies and think about okay, what are they doing for the first couple of years? They're just beginning to construct the background. That's that's exactly what they're doing. It's just background, yeah. background, background, background. And because my my particular focus, given my vocation, is always trying to understand people and trying to understand people why people do what they do and why people don't do what they should do and do do what they don't do, et cetera, et cetera. And right now in this very diverse world we live in there's so much there's so many different backgrounds at play and yet mm -hmm. here we are talking on the internet and this stuff this stuff is riding through us and it will and we are you know i would call them spirits well, we could call them other things but these things i mean so 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 Quine is riding through you. Something of him has inhabited you and possessed you, but yet he he hasn't possessed you because you you have taken him in, but you have also sort of twisted him and now are employing his language and his ideas in a way that he could never employ, ostensibly partly because of his background. It's a it's a really crazy thing that we're doing right the terseness now. Terseness and logic of analytic philosophy and the over spiritualism of Pentecostal, the twin Jungian shadows that I've integrated. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a that that is uh, just, that is a sentence that I is, loaded that intentionally because that sentence only makes sense in this little corner because of the background. Yes. 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 See, it's not enough to explicate. You sometimes have to demonstrate. And yes. the reason that I think that this is riding through us is because, as C.S. Lewis said, if all the world were Christian, it might not matter if all the world were uneducated. But as it is, a cultural life will exist outside the church, whether it exists or not. 
To be ignorant and simple now, <clears throat> not to be able to meet the enemies on their own ground would be to throw down our weapons and betray our uneducated brethren who have, under God, no defense but us against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. Wow. Good philosophy must exist, if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. The cool intellect must work not only against the cool intellect on the other side, but against the muddy heathen mysticisms that deny intellect altogether. Most of all, perhaps we need an intimate knowledge of the past. Not that the past has any magic about it, but because we cannot study the future and yet need something to set against the present. <clears throat> to remind us that the basic assumptions have been quite different in different periods and that much of that seems uncertain to the uneducated is merely temporary fashion. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be deceived by the local errors of his native village. The scholar has lived many times and is therefore in some degree immune from the great cataract of nonsense that pours from the press and microphone of his own age. Citation. I don't know. I just pulled the quote up. I just have it here. Um, I'm get. Uh, I don't know the exact citation for it. Um, oh, learning in wartime. Oh, I just googled it. Learning in wartime. But notice okay, he says. Essays. But but wait, but wait. Cool intellect must not work only against the cool intellect on the other side, but against the muddy he's and mysticisms that deny intellect altogether. That's the analytic philosophy and the postmodernism. Yeah. Not that the past has any magic about it, but because we cannot study the future and yet need something to set against the present to remind us that the basic assumptions have been quite different in different periods and that much that seems certain to the uneducated is merely temporary fashion. Background and network again. Yep. Yep. Right. We tried to figure out what meaning was. First, we tried to locate it in the, in the word. Then we tried to locate it in the world. Then we tried to locate it in us. And as it turns out, all three of those things are part of the background. Now what they get right, the postmodern, is that the background is in some sense radically contingent. But the principles which make the background, the network, and our understanding work is that all of it coheres and follows against certain principles which guide the universe. A logos, if you will. And that's why the contingency, the radical contingency of the background doesn't bother me. It is, uh, who was it that said, it is a, uh, Wittgenstein said, um, to get rid of all of those assumptions doesn't change anything. It leaves the world exactly as it was. And it leaves the logos right where it is. Yeah, yeah. You can claim to have deconstructed the logos, but you didn't. You changed the light. The, the, you try. What is it? Who was it? Heidegger that said, if you change the meaning of the word, you change the meaning of the world. Hmm. Maybe it was him. I don't know. Maybe it was someone else. Who knows? We're, we're citing the mists of history now. But, <laughs> but, but no. And what certain academics have done is to use their linguistic heft as a way to disempower, to undercut and undermine the moral, epistemological, and social standing of the people who are just trying to get by in life. And they say, well, you don't know because you don't have all of this linguistic machinery that I've pulled out. And my answer is your network of meaning, Mr. Philosopher, exists against the background that are being created by all those other people. And um, I am not blinded by science, nor am I dazzled by your, your, your wizardry. Your attempts to use your degrees to claim that you have sovereignty over meaning by your superior level of interpretation don't hold because I've seen what you do to regular people in the way that you misinterpret them to make them look bad or to disempower them within a conversation. Yeah. The... Greg Bonson was giving a lecture and he said, one of the most difficult things that you can do, we're now quoting a Dr. Bonson. So again, not many people know who Greg Bonson is or was, and we're not going to go into dominionism and we're not presuppositionalists, but the presuppositionalists did have some insights into things. And one of the things he said, one of the most, he said many times that the professor will get up and disempower you and attempt to come after you. 
by dazzling you with insights and citations and quotes. And he said, one of the most humbling things that a Christian apologist can do, especially is to say to somebody, look, I'm not familiar with the jargon that you're using, but respectfully, sir, I think I can keep up with you. If you can explain what you mean by the terms of debate, I think we can have a productive conversation. And I think that a lot of times that the, the educated classes have sought to win the debate by demonstrations of dazzling force. The reason I have 137,000 followers is because I'm like Indiana Jones. They stepped out with their dazzling force and they show how quickly they can use their sword and they dazzle around. And then I pull out my, my Twitter account and go back <laughs> my, my Twitter account and go. Hmm. And I, that's why my article on Dume went gangbusters. Cause I just put my finger on the point and said, forget your jargon bang and all the attempts to nitpick it didn't work and you'd be surprised at the people at seminaries who are in the dms you'd be surprised at the philosophers who are in my dms are like where did you come from who taught you what are you doing uh because they they think that because they they identify as being deep thinkers in the same way that caitlin jenner identifies as being a woman it's an identity that they hold for themselves. I must be a deep thinker because I have all of this jargon and all of this intellectual machinery. And I sit here and I think your mastery of the jargon of the day is just that, the mastery of the jargon of the day. I mean, if you've ever heard some of those hicks, you know, Brian Regan does a bit where he's like, they always talk about complicated jargon. Like they'll have a tractor pulling contest and some guy said, well, I came out and gave her 40,000 RPMs and then the turbos kick in. There was 28.9.5 PSI. And then I had my flux, you know, and he's sitting there going on and on. So I could feel the cylinders begin to move there. And then the carburetor started to go. So I had to shut her down because the clutch was going to be riding too hard. It was going to burn her out. And you sit there and you go, that guy's got a lot of jargon too about his engines. He's got really complicated language. Who has more intellectual horsepower? And some people are trying to get up and flex their muscles and say, look at my intellectual horsepower and try and intimidate people. And I find this to be an act of intellectual bullying. And I take great joy in the fact that the size of my account is an indictment of the way that Christian intellectuals have been handling themselves over the past two decades. I take and, quite and, a lot of joy in that. And in, in what way is the internet sort of the rise of the autodidact. Because, you know, it's, there's because no it's question. Proven that, it's proven that your degree only covers the eight and a half by 11 space on your wall. It doesn't cover your mistakes. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Um, because the, I mean, because we've, we've, we've been watching the collapse of institutions and of course, the background for the background for these that they have meaning because of their backgrounds and the backgrounds have been these institutions and of yeah. course this is a and it's very hard for people to recognize what a new thing this is thomas aquinas wasn't thomas aquinas because he had a degree from such and such a place thomas aquinas is thomas aquinas because of what he did but before that, he was a monk who slowly gained some reputation. But Thomas even Aquinas, that monkishness was the background. Thomas Aquinas didn't become Thomas Aquinas, probably too long after his death. Exactly. Um, and that same reality will quick. continue today. Go ahead. Give me a second. I got to use the washroom real quick. But I have I have a thought about this. Um, okay. Remind me about basketball and and getting dunked on. Excuse the water milk. My apologies for that. Ah, no problem. So, so I have basketball I have and this, dunked on. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, typically speaking, the person who is trained is usually going to be able to do things that the person who is untrained is not going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you've been trained and taught and had to go through the crucible of a really serious education, that's a really nice shorthand for someone who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep.
But the conflation between epistemology and ontology, the ontology of the skill set and the epistemology of the skill set are two different things, right? Yep. So the knowledge of of so how do I how do I say this? Um I don't oh, I don't know if I broke that apart right. Um whether or not you're l- learning your epistemological engagement in the literature has led you to become ontologically the person who can actually engage in that thing is two different things. Right. Whether you've been actually formed into a great basketball player, whether you just know a lot about basketball is two different things. The ontology of being a great basketball player and knowing about basketball players is two different things. Right. So <clears throat> there's an apocryphal story of in, in sports. Now we have like all of these very advanced analytics and someone says, I know more about basketball than you. He says, do you know about defensive zone ratings? Can you tell me about, um, you know, Michael Jordan's efficiency rating with the 1997 Chicago Bulls and how that relates to the triangle offense run by, uh, and go on and on and on and on. And I can cite the statistics and the guys, and the guys sitting there saying like, I don't know. I just play basketball. I was coached back in the day, but you know, we didn't really have a coach and I'm not da 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 but I worked really hard at it and I practiced for months and I've been playing for years and yada, yada, yada. And the guy says, well, you know, I've studied stati- this statistically and I know all blah, blah, blah. So we go to play basketball and the guy who's knows all of the lingo and knows all the jargon comes out onto the court and starts ordering people around. And the other guy is not really quick on his feet verbally, but he just takes the ball says, that's not going to work. We're going to do this. No, it is. No, it's not. Okay, fine. You do your way. I'll do mine. We'll play against each other. And the first thing the guy who is kind of slow with his language does is dunk on the other guy, and then dunk on him again, and then dunk on him again, and then dunk on him again. And you know about the statistics of basketball. I know about what actually works in playing the game. Right. It's it's I haven't by- mem I haven't memorized the statistics. I haven't memorized the jargon. But my background and my network, all of it's there. I don't know how to put it, how to encode it into language as well as you. But that doesn't mean that my reservoir of knowledge isn't still deep. Right. The most and what most NBA yeah. coaches were <laughs> NBA players. Players. But we don't remember them for being players. There's a video of soccer coaches standing on the sidelines reminding their players that they used to play. And what it shows is like like a ball will come out like 50 feet in the air and it'll come grinding right down toward a coach. And the coach is wearing dress shoes. And while he's pointing out other people, he sticks out his foot and stops the ball. So it lands right on his foot and just holds it there and then puts it down and just punts it aside. Well, and his players are on the bench and they go. Yeah. And it's like the coach is saying, I used to do this. Just so y'all know. But but generally speaking, if you look at the top players of the game and you look at the top coaches of the game, it's a very different list because those are two separate. They're they're connected, but one doesn't necessarily mean the other. Um, Michael the Jordan great, was never a great NBA basketball coach. Never will be. The, the, the great coach is not the person who has the most knowledge. It's the person who can transfer the most knowledge. Yes. Well, transfer, implement, and also has knowledge in other realms. They can build a structure because obviously in the NBA, a successful, you win with a successful system that can do teaching. whole ranges of things. Well, you can you're teach, teaching. but, but that's you know, what you're doing. You're teaching those systems. You have right. to be able to teach. And so the great coaches are the ones who can uh, analyze, implement, understand, teach, and build and all of that. Right. And the, the reason why I have with my account, I have a maddeningly large following compared to a lot of academics who think that my following ought to belong to them is because I teach. Right. And I have given, I have given, I hope in this, a demonstration of some of what, of what my skill set is. Yeah. 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 I've, no, I've been offering so. a proof of it. And, and I like to, I love it when they try to, pick out little itty bitty things and say, well, you didn't like somebody will bring up, I don't, let's pick up something. 
possible world semantics. And I sit there and I go, and they go, well, you really haven't understood. And I sit there and I go, really? We're going to go into the realm of formal logic? So here's the continental philosophical world in Europe, and here's the, the Anglosphere. And then in the Anglosphere, we have the different areas of philosophy, and we're going to settle on analytic philosophy. And then we're going to go to logic. And then we're going to go into modal logic. And then there's going to be different forms of possible world semantics. And none of them are universally accepted across all philosophy. Most of them are disputed by many people. And so, no, the fact that I uh, that you wanted to pull out Lewis's view on possible worlds and talk about close worlds and talk about whether or not various forms of of whether or not a subjunctive proposition is necessarily modal does not impress me. Like, I know some of us think quantified modal logic can handle all of this just fine without the use of possible worlds. Searle happens to be somebody who doesn't think the possible world is necessarily all that good. Plantinga loved them though, so who knows? Yeah. But, but the point is that, I'm sorry, but I don't need to understand how close possible worlds function and whether or not we're using things in the subjunctive mood or whether or not we ought to ditch all that for Bayesian probability analysis. I don't need to know that because the average person, when they're saying, you know, Bo Jackson would have been really great if he wasn't hurt. They're not sitting there thinking, you know, there's a series of, for a set of all possible worlds in which Bo Jackson does not get hurt, the closest possible worlds to the actual possible worlds are the worlds in which Bo Jackson runs for a lot of years. Like, that's not what people are doing. They're saying, like, he was pretty good. If he hadn't got hurt, look at the trajectory. That's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, when I'm driving my car and I see a car in front of me, I'm like, well, this hasn't happened yet. So, well, I guess there's a possible world in which I hit the car in front of me. And is that the closest possible? Like, I don't do that. Right. Like, that's not what people are doing. Well, I, well, I don't know right? about your book because geez, I'm interested again in. <laughs> So you, but there's, a, there's, I want to pin this down. I okay. don't think that your people's mastery of niche parts of the, I hate it when people try to try to win fights, intellectual fights about large scale issues by pulling people into little niche corners of the world in order to try and drown them in jargon. Yes. So when that happens, I'll do a deep dive and I'll talk to people and I, and a lot of it, I already know. And I'll pull it up and be like, well, yeah, that's disputed by a lot of people. And all forms of, there's no universally accepted possible world semantics, which all philosophers grab onto. It's all disputed. And there's different ideas around possible worlds, whether or not close worlds actually are a good way to understand this. All of this is like, this is all very cutting edge. And it's not like, you know, Aristotelian logic and the law of the excluded middle or the law of non-contradiction where it's pretty well accepted by everybody. It's not like that. Or people will try to pull out um, various different understandings of universal and existential quantification and said, well, if you quantify that, blah, blah, blah. it's like, that's not how we're using plain language. People are using regular language to communicate. And trying to force them into your formalism, into your formal language in order to pull them off of their rock so that you can knock them around. It's a little bit like um, saying, I'm tougher than you, so we're going to have this fight on ice where I wear skates and you're wearing shoes. And you're going to slide all over and I'm going to beat you up. And, and my answer is to kind of tell people, like, don't get on the ice with them. Wait for him to come off the ice and have the fight there. Don't. I, I hate this. It's intellectual bullying by people who for whatever reasons think that this is an appropriate way to engage in apologetics. And then we wonder why we're losing. William Lane Craig doesn't do this. I have watched that man get onto shows with like 18 year old YouTubers and sit without a hint of snark or sarcasm and gently explain to people and meet them on their level and meet them where they're at and not try to win through the overwhelming force of language and their credentials and putting on of airs and, and well, you've, completely misunderstood the difference between postmodernism and post-structuralism as if like i mean and stop and it. and i would hope that some of the reason for what you just pointed out is because this man besides being educated and and knowing some things and all of that is a disciple i was just making an example up no no I'm no just, but I'm it's a disciple of jesus christ because there is something in him that says this 18-year-old kid is yeah. an image bearer of God yes. who deserves to be loved. And yeah, so therefore, 
the the That's orientation of love is going to be despite all of the other things and all of the other payloads I'd like to deploy and all of the other audience. Whoop, whoop. Oh, sorry. Sorry for a second. <laughs> there we go. I disappeared. I, I didn't sorry. think you were going to storm out of the room if I recognized no. that William Lane Craig is a Christian and acting out of love. <laughs> <laughs> William Lane Craig act out of love. I'm out. We're done. Well, no, no, no. There are no. certain but, things but, we but, can't break bread over. <laughs> right. But what, what, I, what I want to do for the audience with you is because background is important and i want to i want to help people listen to you that's what i want and so i'm very interested about not only i'm i'm, I'm i try to primarily be interested in the people and that is our, yeah. the person the individual the, that is you that is you now I'm also interested in the the vehicles. So one vehicle for you has been Twitter. Another vehicle for you has been YouTube. And so we have all these vehicles and so you know the the these philosophers are you know background and network and and so in a lot of ways people with um people with standing, people with reputation, all of these things. And, and again, it's not it's not bad. We we all of these things are tools that we use, but my goal is to help people find truth. And and part of what we're ha experiencing now with the internet is the destruction of institutions partly because of all of the things that you just pointed out. Right. That there are and 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 what's really difficult for us is that there's not nothing there if you actually manage to get a degree and yada 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 and gain all of these things there's not nothing there but people we now the internet is forcing us to once again recalibrate and while it's i think true and important to recognize that Thomas Aquinas is a name that is nearly universally known or Augustine of Hippo because they actually accomplish things. And it's extremely rare to know a guy's name from, you know, you know, late, late, uh, the late classical period. There must have been something there because he has been sort of in a Darwinian sense. He has been vetted as something, whether or not he gets everything right. It's another argument, but mm -hmm. Right now, what people are interested in is, all right, so Paul talks to randos on the internet, and some people will know you because you have a a big, a big ish, and you know, five, you know, six, uh, it's a six figure account. And it's interesting because then there's seven figure, yada, yada. But even those hierarchies don't necessarily say much or can't tell you everything. And so a big part of what we're doing right now in terms of differentiating network and background is in fact, trying to recalibrate our things. So then when you say, I'm writing a book, I am very interested in this and I'm going to watch this very carefully because it, it's not, because once you have to jump platforms and transition between subtleties of backgrounds, things are going to be interesting. And I'm really, mm -hmm. really interested about the fact that number one, you are writing a book. Number mm -hmm. two, what on earth is going to happen to this book? Because of course, publishing and, and university publishing, I mean, everything has been sort of disrupted, but not dislodged and because we can't have everything dislodged. Otherwise we're living in chaos, but this, and, and so then to me, it's very interesting because I think Peterson, one of his early things that he mentioned first is that one of the things that human beings do is we are looking, we look for truth in the way that we look for food. That's sort of the exaptation. And so, you know, many people have found their way to your door because they have, they have seen you say things or do things that say to them, hmm, I can, I can trust him. I'm disposed. Not to just say word salad and walk away, or disposed to say not to, autodidact and walk away, because of course the little network that I'm participating in is mostly made up of 
low status autodidacts who are thinking their way through a system while simultaneously holding down jobs that are either high status and other disconnected fields or no status at all because they're struggling in different ways. But the real thing we need to do is to try to figure out when someone is telling us something that is true and useful and helpful to get to something that we can sort of say in very short terms, glory to arrive to pursue us towards a telos and an eschaton. And so, you know, for me to have you on the channel behind some of this is some people just have this sort of woke, non-woke, all of this, all of the stuff in which you're, you're, the being that you are on Twitter has ascended. But now it's like, okay, he's entering a new realm. And this is going to be very interesting to watch. Give me just one second. I have to grab something. Give me a sec. But okay. yes, the medium is yes. going to be different. Yes. <clears throat> and that's not nothing. That is. Oh, no. That is far, far, far from nothing, especially again, given I really love the nomenclature that you've given in terms of the network and the background and that metaphor that now it's like, oh, you've given me a really nice compact shorthanded way and you and you and you embedded it in a nice thing so i can sort of take this little thing and clip it and other people are going to have the aha moment and that's that's going to push you up their their status hierarchies and so that's that's what i'm that's what i'm very interested in and then you say you're writing a book i thought oh wow so the local distance uh, story is about to get more interesting well uh the first point is yeah um i started writing on twitter because i i i had left the job and i was sitting at home and i had two of my friends come over and they prayed for me and they said we feel you should start writing i had just bought a house and written on one of the bathroom walls was the words start writing but it was W-R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G as in like a mill, right? Uh -huh. And I said, what is, so I'm a Pentecostal. And I say, okay, Lord, I will trust my friends. What's the lowest barrier to entry? And if it takes off there, then Lord, I'm in the right spot. And I had 30,000 followers in a couple of months. And I thought, okay, this is the right spot. Um, obviously. What people don't know is that for years before that, after the grievance study in 2018, I had gotten hold of James Lindsay and I was talking to him in the DMs. I would say, oh, it's like this. And he's told me, he's like, you have a gift for putting this stuff like perfectly and putting your finger on it in a way that communicates it to people. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And part of my strategy on Twitter, because they like to pick at words and nitpick and go after things, is to put things so clearly that when people misinterpret you on purpose, it looks silly. Searle has an example of a hamburger. I always keep quoting John Searle. We're going to keep doing it because it's fun. fun. Um, I also lampshade my discussing of talking about John Searle. Um, <clears throat> he talks about hamburgers. And he says, like, so you go to a place, you order a hamburger, they bring you out a hamburger, it's encased in concrete. So you say, okay, look, hamburger, no concrete. So they bring you out one that's encased in like a steel box. Okay, hamburger, not encased in anything I can't open. So they bring you out a pet a rotten hamburger. He's like, okay, hamburger, not rotten. Not, so they bring you out a petrified Egyptian hamburger. And it's like, his point is that there's an infinite number of ways people can choose to misinterpret you if they decide to take the text just as it is and ignore the background or to substitute their own cynical background in for you. Donald Davidson, and a lot of people miss Donald Davidson's understanding of charitability. What Donald Davidson's principle of charitability is not just an, a principle of kindness, it's an also deeply epistemic. Because what he said is, uh, if we're going to understand people, we must count them right in most matters. Hmm. And his goal is not to say that everyone's right. His point is that try to understand that person as though they're saying something is true or that could plausibly be true to them in order to understand them. It's, it's it's deeply it's, communicative and epistemic, and it's just like one of Jordan Jordan Peterson's first twelve rules. Listen to someone as if they have something to tell you. Basically, that's what he says. 
And it's and it's a it's 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 wisdom. And it's something that you actually can't live without because if you just stop listening to people, well, we see that. Um, so a wonderful example of this is um, oh, what was, hold on one second, a second. One second, I need to find the name of this journal. Um, where is it? This is too important to, to stop. This is another paper nobody read. Which is, which is probably most papers. Um, the Journal for Cultural and Religious of Thought, uh, the Theory. Meeting Mary and Myth, Pursuing the Pre-Postmodern Apologetics. A.G. Holdier. And if this is the paper I'm thinking of, What he tries to do is he takes John Caputo and William Lane Craig and he says, what is it about each of these men that people find compelling? Hmm. And what resources are there in there that we can use to create a Christian apologetic? He's not looking to say who's got the right argument. Right. But he's saying there's something about these people that somebody's finding compelling. Right. That tells us something. Right. Why? What are they looking for? And so what I'm trying to do with a lot of stuff, with a lot of what I'm doing is say, why do people find this compelling? What is it about this that is compelling to people? And why is it compelling to them? Nobody, like this is a paper that's very important. I think Caputo's wrong about everything but he's compelling to somebody. Right. When, what's her name? The Who does the Star of Girls? The, the shorter woman who ate cake on a toilet. What's her name? Oh, I never saw it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I haven't, I, I I know who you're talking about, but I, I don't know her, her name. Let's pull it up. Just because uh, Girls was talked about, but I didn't have HBO and so never watched it. Uh, hold on. Lena Dunham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I people said, oh, Lena Dunham's only popular because culture is terrible, blah, blah. And I said, no, 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 no. That shows driving discourse among sheer elites. She's got a hold on the culture and everyone loves her. There's a reason. People find her compelling. Yeah. You'd better find out why. Yeah, yeah. She's yep. compelling and you're not. The whole winsomeness debate missed the point. It's not mm -hmm. about tone. It's about why somebody finds something compelling. Setting the other person's taste as the bar for what makes you winsome or not is signing yourself up to failure because they're going to bake their epistemic and moral value structure into whether or not they find you winsome and you're going to be stuck having the battle on their turn. That's not right. Something underneath at the bottom in the background is 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 driving what finds them compelling, something in their background, something in who they are, something in what they've experienced. And you'd better find out what that is. You have to understand why certain things are compelling. The reason why liberalism and the absolute autonomy took off is because in the background of the American story is the idea of freedom. That's part of what's driving that. So you have to be able to have an, a story of freedom that, that, uh, that also carries with its structure. Leftists have a, there's a, in the beautiful trouble, which is the leftist toolkit, they say, beware the tyranny of structurelessness, right? The left wants, I want to destroy all the hierarchies, but I still want a structure. Well, that's not going to go very far. So even they understand the need for, for structure, right? So, so the political right wants to wield power and exercise power, but the political right doesn't want to 
or hasn't been able to do the work to make their vision compelling. They haven't put forth a positive vision yet that's compelling. We love to critique, and we're very good at it. In a certain sense, we're where the left was in the 80s with critical theory. But at some point, a compelling, a compelling vision needs to put be put forth. And that is... And I'd like... Go ahead. Keep going. I'd like to suggest that my simple paintings are... I am the Bob Ross that's getting rid of the desert landscapes. <laughs> what did that... Klein say? That we've offended the sensibilities of those who prefer desert landscapes? I'm Bob Ross and I'm paying happy little metaphysics all over their little desert landscapes. <laughs> well, that is, I mean, that you said, it caught my attention. I don't, you were talking to Benjamin Boyce and I'm, I don't remember who else was in the conversation, but you said that then too, and I think it's still important. And I see that in a lot of different in a lot of different spaces on the right, where they are they are working really hard to say no, not the left, no, not the left, re without recognizing that most of those people on the left used to be their people, and if they can't figure out what happened and what failed, they will never actually be able to address why all these people left yes yeah that is like they walked out on you right. why right. they're coming right. back now right why this is the only fans girl i posted on twitter yesterday i <laughs> so a lot of people were going on this only fans girl who recently converted to christianity okay have you seen this no this nala ray I have no idea. Uh, this is this OnlyFans girl who kind of got escape velocity. She's got red hair. And she was going on all these things, talking about the joy of cheating and being on OnlyFans. And then recently she's come out, and I'm a Christian now. And she was on Michael Knowles' podcast. Oh. I like Jesus now. And I am I have turned away from this. And all the right was dogging on her, being like, oh, she's just moving from one space to another. And so I put up a tweet with a picture of her and her red hair on the Michael Knowles podcast. Yeah, I see it here. Said, I do not know Nala Ray's heart, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Hmm. I, I what's, well, what's the story insincere. with this woman? She was an only fan, or is an only fans, and she's was converted. an only fans model, and then she had a conversion, got baptized, and then is claiming Christ and to preach Christ. Well, I can I thought, understand why she'd leave it. I mean, that's just it. You have to, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to think of that. Yeah, OnlyFans model, not a great strategy for life. So, but, why, but they're why saying, would, like, why well, would, why would people dump on her for this? Well, oh, well, she was grifting there. Now she's grifting for clout on Christianity. They think oh, that she's made a, she was, she was an e girl. They're saying she's just picked up a new audience now. OnlyFans slowed down for her. So now she's moving to something else. And the right is being cynical. Why are we giving this woman a platform? And I oh. sat there and I thought, look, man, the reason that the right has a grifter problem is because all of the people who could have done this work decided that they just wanted to stay home and grill. Mm. They didn't mm. want to get involved. And now they're looking around and saying, well, I just want to come in and fix it and don't, and I'm going to take power. You stop that and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you could get involved. You could you could say something persuasive. Yeah, yeah. You um, can at least try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably I, be bad I, at it, but you learn as you go. <laughs> and maybe you'd have something to say. Maybe you could be compelling. Yeah. And maybe you could be compelling, other than having cynical hot takes about how the right can gain political power and be Machiavellian. And this is how we're going to take the culture back. You could speak to the yeah. deep seated things that people have, yeah. the deep questions that people have about meaning. My apologetics thread from two years ago stands up on its both feet. I was right then. It wasn't even me. Other people got it right too, but I was right then and I'm right now. It's about meaning. We're in a meaning crisis. That is it. Anti-wokeness for me was a way into the meaning crisis. It always was. It was always apologetics, man, right right from the ground up. And um, it used to be that we didn't want to embarrass ourselves in front of the evolutionists by claiming creationism. 
Now we don't want to embarrass ourselves in front of the LGBTQTP plus I people by being against this or that. And so my answer is just quit being embarrassed, I guess. I mean, I and actually autodidacts have a, have a leg up in that. You're embarrassing me in front of the Romans. <laughs> Yeah, if you have that attitude, I mean, I guess, I mean, you can be embarrassed in front of the Romans or ripped apart by the lions. I guess you could pick one. Um, well, now every everyone who was well, but, this is the, this is the uh, the Donatist controversy, of course, because uh, everyone who was worried about being embarrassed, um, it didn't go so well. Which is basically what Christ says: if you're if you're worried about being embarrassed by being associated with me. Hey man, it's foolishness to the Greeks, right? Yeah. And so the right is very concerned about the left's apostasy. I mean, the left loves to speak prophetically to the right about you're all concerned about my brother in Christ. Have you read your own literature, which is all about power and clout and everything else? And you all talk like this. And then when it, my heart got broken by Beth Allison Barr in the following way. On Twitter, there was a spat, and Chrissy Stroop was one of these people, a trans activist now, a secular humanist, who is kind of in the discourse, endorsed Dume's book, and this became a hot topic of conversation. Uh -huh. And Barr made a tweet to the effect of, look, we can have disagreements about these things and still not engage in that, da 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 And Chrissy Stroop was like, no, you can't. And Barr deleted her tweet. And said, I just think Christ hasn't been well represented today. And my answer was, by who? It's like, I thought at that moment that Barr had drawn a line in the sand. And then it didn't draw a line in the sand. Or she didn't draw a line in the sand. And I just sat and I thought, you know, by adopting the posture of the right needs to be shamed into reforming their behavior and the left needs to be coked into the warm bosom of the love of our savior. You've, you've adopted a double standard, which everyone sees. And so here's a controversial comment. I actually think that some people on the right could really minister to the needs of people on the left. And I think a lot of those leftists could have important things to say to the people on the right. It's like they're talking about marriage and the right is obsessed with here are the rules that make a marriage work. And the left is saying, here's how you romance a woman. And so you end up with neither. You end up with one side that has lots of torrid flings and torrid romances, but no marriages. And you have the other side to have a bunch of marriages that are about as exciting as watching paint dry. And maybe we could integrate those two things together, but we won't because everyone has decided that their own temperament is exhaustive of the truth and it's wrong. I'm not saying that the left is propositionally correct. I think they've adopted more false foundational theories than the right has. I do. But that doesn't mean that the right doesn't have something to learn or take from the left. The left has, in my view, now people point at Donald Trump and I'll say, okay, sure. You can point at Donald Trump and say, Trump, Trump, Trump. And the left has used the existence of Donald Trump as a get out of jail free card to avoid introspection on their own behalf. And, and the results have been utterly disastrous. Um, and I exist on the borders of things as does Peterson. <laughs> And so a lot of the people I hang out with are kind of those fringy people. Yeah. And a lot of the people on the right who are successful, who are are going places, are kind of fringy. Yeah. They're just coded as right wing, but they're fringy like the leftists are, but they see what the left they they're they're I, I can't do this. It's not right. This isn't good. And and what will be these two groups. could probably minister to each other if they weren't busy trying to win the debate by freezing each other out. Yeah. 
Well, and I would argue that they they actually do do it. They just not again, probably doing it on Twitter. I mean, they do in real life in places. You can find that. It's not that hard to find. Just so I I saw that the rest is history. They're gonna do a they're gonna do a, a they're gonna do an episode on the 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 rise and fall of disco and they had Dominic Sandbrook dressed up as Michael Travolta or or um photoshopped his face into there. And so I thought, you know, I thought of the old now I'm too old. I'm older than you are, but I thought of all in the family. And so then I got I got caught into a YouTube all in the family nostalgia jag and i was watching i watched the pilot of all in the family and i thought yeah i i remember 1971 and to watch the pilot of all in the family now in this environment it was like wow the world has really changed you could mm. never play all in the family on tv today for a whole no. host of reasons but at the same time, Archie Bunker was a buffoon. He was hated for his his racism and his sexism and his, you know, all, all kinds of good reasons to to all kinds of flaws in Archie Bunker that you could point out. But the, the funny thing about it was he was a bigot, but he was our bigot. And um there was a there was a, it was the whole point of the show was Archie is still a part of the family. And you got to deal with Archie. And Meathead and Archie continued to live in the same house. And if you if you watch the programs, it's like Meathead and Archie are learning from each other. You know, me Ar, Ar, Archie every day complains the fact that Meathead is sponging off him because Meathead is getting his university degree and all the ways that Archie is evil. This is 1971. And but Archie still feeds Meathead. And Edith is somewhere in the middle, and Edith is just seen as just this complete, you know, she she is she is she's completely the unliberated woman. But every now and then, Edith says something which is just blinding, and it's There's, like, no. but and and in real life, that happens regularly, but it can't happen on Twitter. And no, and so again, no. back to this question of medium. It's this is one of the things we are coming to terms with at this moment because mediums are disrupted. Yeah, but writing the book just isn't isn't just a medium for me. Writing is the philosopher's laboratory, right? And so I'm working out what I think. Right. Uh, Jordan was writing his book and telling you what he's doing. It. Yeah, you're getting a taste of what I'm talking about in my book. Right. So I'm I'm interested. I'm 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 excited about this. This is good. So what we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to go through the history of how postmodernism got in. Uh, Jordan Peterson was largely correct about postmodern neo-Marxism, despite the shrieks to the commentary. The Christian academic world and the academic world at large has got their hand caught in the cookie jar and is now worried about losing their legitimacy. Yeah, they don't need to worry about it. It's already gone. My on Monday, on sure. Monday my transmission blew up. On my car, I have a twenty. I had a twenty sixteen Honda Civic, and it had a manual transmission, and the transmission blew up. And so I limped it into the dealership, and I was walking around the dealership, and I was looking around. It's like, what am I going to do? And they said, Yeah, that's the, something with the transmission. We're not sure. And I just like instantly know that car, and I'm like sitting here going, like it's fifteen hundred bucks of labor just to get to the transmission, probably, probably thousand dollars. I'm looking at three grand. I'm like, mm, is it even worth it? So I was like, I'll just get the equity out of it and get a new car. So I did that. And then the next day, the service people didn't know that I had already cut a deal on a new vehicle that I was going to be picking up. And they called me or I had already picked up and they called me and they said to me, so we've got your car here. We regret to inform you. It's not under warranty. I was like, I kind of figured that hundred thousand dollar, hundred thousand kilometer warranty. It was 102,000 kilometers. So done. And they said to me, um, yeah, it's not just, it's the transmission is fully gone and the apparatus to the transmission that has blown up, like the whole thing needs to be replaced. And also the clutch needs, the system needs to be completely done because it's burned out. So it's like $11,000 worth of repairs. That's more than the car is worth. Now the dealership gave me a trade-in on the vehicle, which was not great because they knew the tranny was going to have to be done. But, and I pulled the trigger on it and I was lucky because 
they bought it and they probably with the amount of work because now they're a dealership. So they'll just take the parts and just do what they want to do and get it done like cheaply for them. But, but, but what will happen here is that they'll break even or make a little bit of money on it. But had I had to sell that car, I'd have sold it for less than I owed on it. Yeah. I'd have lost my shirt. Yeah. The institutions are in the position that I was as I was limping that car home in fourth gear and burning out the clutch to get it to that's where they're at now. That is where they already are. The transmission has already blown. Yeah. Okay. Chris Rufo's work on the plagiarism scandal. Plagiarism is just showing the depth of the rot. How Asriel uh, talked about this in 1999 in an interview. He said, like, the person who would come from 1937 or 42 would show up and say, well, they might be impressed by the technology, but they'd see the system of courses and the system of credits and students going to class and people handing out degrees. And they'd say that the glacial force of academia is just continuing to go. And it's not. Um, what Ricky Wilchins in Queer Theory, Gender Theory says that the the the, the academy was conquered by postmodernism and academics saying, well, technically it hasn't because postmodern and then doing a whole thing about the various slices of postmodernism, which are sliced so thin, have missed the point. You clearly you've been taken over. Your humanities departments are utterly corrupted and everybody knows it. It's it's crystal clear by this point that the institutions have rotted themselves out with this. Um, I have people who, my friends who have become teachers said, basically, I learned social justice. When I got into the classroom, I learned as I went. Hmm. Most of your teachers are autodidacts by force. Just tossed in. Um, well, I wouldn't say most, but a good chunk of them anyway. Learn so nothing but social justice. And then after six months of their kids coming back with terrible test scores said, uh-oh, and probably went on YouTube to study John Dewey. It's probably what happened. How do I teach? Um. So the attempts at preserving the institutions, I mean, like there's certain, like there's capital there, intellectual capital, but I mean, Harvard has taken a beating like badly and these people are all saying there's a there's a certain sort of academic that says we need to close ranks and in the same way that that a lot of the christian deconstructors are looking at evangelicalism says you are beset by and they do all their whole list of things i'm just like you guys could take a stand to take a look in the mirror i saw one person who will remain nameless on twitter who is a, a reasonably well-known person in literature and who is ostensibly a christian i don't know that Claims to be a Christian. I don't know the uh, heart of anyone, but I'll assume that this person is. And there was on, on, on Twitter with somebody and said, there's this odd thing someone asked. It said that men in the South called their wives my bride. And even men who are like very advanced in age. And this person responded, well, I can't help but think that they long for their the wives' youth. And that's why they're saying my bride. Hmm. And I sat there and I said, that's how you interpret that? Not like I love you as much as the day I married you, or I'm you're still the woman I made those vows to. Yeah. I was like, yeah. As soon as you, that stuff that you say probably goes over real well in the academy, but once you walk it out into the real world and you start using your interpretive mechanisms and you come up with that, I can yeah. see that what you're doing is really broken methods. Yeah. Searle talked about this again. I'm going to keep quoting him in the New York Review of Books. He had, he he brought a lot of this to the surface of these people engaged in this sort of rhetoric, using rhetoric instead of arguments, pushing forth relativistic doctrines and all the rest of it. And these people claimed not to have been doing it. And he said, and he responded in the New York Review of Books. He wrote the article. There were several letters saying by the people who he called out, and he said, "We're not doing this." And Searle said, "Well, they've claimed that I have misinterpreted them, so let's all remind them of exactly what they said." And he list listed the quote, and he said, "I get the feeling that these people say these things at conferences and in academia, where their audiences are very sympathetic, but in the bright light of the New York Review of Books, it's not so flattering, is it?" And I think that all of what's been going on in the academy. In the bright light of the internet, when you have to say it to normal people without covering it under jargon, it, it's like the person who goes from looking at their face in candlelight to looking at their face in like one of those gas station bathrooms where you've got those bright fluorescent lights shining down and every single blackhead and blemish on your face instantly shows up and you go, oh, I've aged, right? It's like that. 
It's like everything has shown up. It's like shining, you know, it's like, oh, I see what's happening here. The bright lights of the world have been shine on, shone on this stuff now. And we're seeing the rot. And it's becoming inescapable. And the question now is like, I've seen people who five years ago were saying it's not happening, who are now looking and going, oh, it is. And like I said, a number of, oh, it was more than a year ago now. Remember the neocons were libs that were mugged by reality? The Barry Weiss people, who who I love and is a follower of mine on Twitter, and I follow her. We're mutuals. I love Barry Weiss. But Barry Rice and Dave Rubin and all these people are the new generation of liberals that are getting mugged by reality. Hmm. And so part of what my book is, is to show both what's gone on, what's happened, and how that is deep, is a deep part of the meta crisis and the crisis of meaning. Not just in terms of linguistic meaning and how that happens, and not just in terms of perception, but in the larger sense of logocentrism, teleology, that sort of realm of meaning. And I think that the cultural apologetics that was so mocked by people is going to come back. And I think it's actually the only kind of apologetics that can happen. And I think the people, or particularly the Christians on the right who like to make fun of Dr. Peterson, might want to ask the same question I asked about Lena Dunham is, I actually did a thread on this, why? And even people like the YouTuber Destiny are starting to ask questions like, why did the left abandon men? I hate to break it to y'all, but... But, but when when your only story is men have all the stuff and we want to take the stuff from all the men, and they also have like the highest suicide rates, the highest level of criminality, the lowest levels of education, that story stops holding. And when you try to undermine, undercut, and subvert masculinity to the point where men have no place of being in the world in which to inhabit, because you're obsessed with saying, I don't want to force my way of thinking on the rest of the world. And so I'm going to live this way. But I'm not saying everyone should live this way. And if you, if you say that families are important to worry about birth rates, I'm going to accuse you of being in a fertility cult. Yes, that's my wife and two children. What do you do? Like, stop it. You're just trying to undermine other people's. In the name of your politics, you're just trying to undercut everyone else. And so when the right says, we really care about family, rather than saying, hey, maybe we can care about family with you. You said try to attack their notions of family as patriarchal, undermine and undercut. And, and then what good does this do to anyone? Those luxury beliefs, as Rob Henderson calls them, end up being a situation where the a lot of people in academia who live one way um, produce poor, a sort of cynicism about all of this stuff into the culture where it becomes part of the background and people absorb it as part of their background sure. and make their relational decisions and their decisions about relationships with that as the background. Yeah. And it warps the decision-making. And then we ask what's going on. People say, well, you could get married if you wanted to. Are you saying marriage is good? I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying it's better than singleness. I'm going to continue to say that we don't want a cultural hegemony of patriarchy. And it's da, 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 da. And I'm sitting here going like, looking at these people and saying like, you realize that you've, you're have you treating like the meta pop discourse of 2012 as though it was like the deep bones of eternal truth. And you need to stop doing that because you're getting, like the Christian world is being left behind, I feel like. I feel like in the secular universities, the woke trend is starting to cool off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in the Christian institutions are just heating up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I saw somebody in 2023 say, we're going to look forward to becoming a leader in the DEI space. Like it was 2016. And I just sat there and I thought, man, Christians, I mean, Christ... It's like bell bottoms. If you just wear them long enough, they come back around in fashion. You could just hold true to the faith, man. It'll come back around in fashion if that's what you care about. Like you'll be good. Hey, you'll even be able to say you were ahead of the curve. I just don't understand what they think they're doing. And I mean, I'm no better. I'm a hypocrite with a you've you've I've told you my story. Yeah, I know your There's story. There's plenty of hypocrisy 
on my part in my life for you to pick at. I'm not any better than anyone else. My lessons that I'm saying today have been are taught from deep wounds and from hurt and from getting kicked around. But if what Jesus said is true, we don't need to change it to make it acceptable. This is a flash in the pan. The woke thing is already starting to fall apart. I mean, they're still going through the institutions and that battle still needs to be had. But but in terms of the, the meta crisis of meaning has already reached down into the world and it's here. And boy, wouldn't it be nice if we had like a book that could help us with that, that we could just all read from and interpret together or read from and teach. I mean, it's like literally the moment we have and at the exact moment where the, we're like the, the triangle player in the school band that just is sitting with this triangle and then decides, well, I'm never going to get to play my triangle. I'm going to go to the bathroom and at the one moment where the triangle is going to get the hit. It's like, this is your turn. You can just <laughs> like that little father, son, Holy Ghost, that little triangle, you could just go ding, 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 and it would fit right into the symphony of culture perfectly. And we've decided that, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to try and do something else. Um, And I say that as a person who works in right-wing politics. But my politics come second. They can say whatever they want about me. You're you're just everything is just a mask for whatever, blah, 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 blah. Look, man, you're reading me through a political lens because you want to polarize me. I get it. Um, but you know, when Matthew Vines is giving out who wrote God and the Gay Christian, is getting up and speaking out against queer theory because he sees what's going on with it. And all of the Christians who were embarrassed about Christian social views are sitting in the academy. Like saying like, well, maybe some of this queer theology stuff we could make use of. I'm sitting here going like, we've lost the plot, man, badly. And the right focusing purely on political power when there's a cultural vacuum. Like there's a huge cultural vacuum right now that's going to suck something in. And it's going to suck in something that's got a story and deep roots to fill that void. I hope it's Christ, but it well could be Islam if we're not careful yeah and we need to be watching yeah yeah all right i think it's a good place to land the plane yeah let's let's land i don't have uh i, I don't have six hours today so <laughs> <laughs> all right are you stopping the recording i am stopping the recording unless there's something you want to add before no. i stop no you can stop